Does everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Good. Well, welcome back to, to those of you who are on uh, earlier this morning. Welcome back to the 18th annual Bade P. Sachdev Memorial Lecture. Uh, Professor Sachdev was a well-known neurosurgeon at Mount Sinai Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, he originally was an ENT surgeon, um, and he actually did three residencies. Uh, he came to the United States and started his residency in neurosurgery here at the age of 39. And when he completed, became Leonard Malice's first partner in neurosurgery uh, and worked here for 30 years. Uh, he was first and foremost a consummate neurosurgeon, but also a general surgeon um, and a very, very wise man who imparted so much knowledge and judgment to anyone who was lucky enough to know him. Um, the late neuropathologist, his wife, Ronit Sachdev, established the lecture to foster his memory. Uh, and this has continued uh, with uh, his daughters, who are both uh, outstanding physicians, Rivka and Olka, uh, both academically oriented physicians, uh, Rivka, a neurologist focusing on movement disorders, and Olka, an associate professor of surgery and vascular surgeon at UPMC. Uh, there have been uh, a very, very uh, impressive list. Uh, there has been a very impressive list of people given this lecture, Linda, and as you can see here, some of them are, are internationally famous neurosurgeons. Many of them are scientists and scientifically oriented. And so you are certainly following very large footsteps. Uh, with this, I'd like to turn it over first to Kostas Hegepanias, uh, who's organized uh, today's research day to introduce Linda and then Dr. Germano to make some comments before you get uh, your, your chance to speak to us. So we're certainly looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. So uh, everybody, welcome. We are really, really excited to have Dr. Linda Liao as our featured SAGDEV lecturer today. Uh, Linda is really well known in neurosurgery, uh, in, in the brain tumor field. We're undergrad at Brown University. And, and by the way, Linda, I really enjoyed the JNS article about you. That was just such a wonderful article and really shed some light on you and all your achievements. And I encourage everyone to read that. Um, Linda finished her, her medical degree at, at Stanford. And then she began her residency at UCLA where she also did her PhD in neuroscience. And I'm sensitive to that because I did that as well. It's a very hard route uh, to get a PhD during a neurosurgical residency. So, so hats off to you. And she completed her fellowship at UCLA and, and she also has an MD, MBA. A couple other caveats that I did wanna share about Linda though, that I'd like for the group to really appreciate, in addition to all her pioneering work you'll hear about during her lecture with brain cancer immunotherapies, she's the second woman in the United States to chair an academic neurosurgical department and really the first Asian American woman. So really, really an amazing achievement that we should all recognize that, that she's been, um, she's completed. And, you know, we talked about her score. She's been on a number of boards, including chairing our ABNS board, which is our prestigious uh, board in neurosurgery. And she's been president of the Western Neurosurgical Society and a longtime editor of Journal of Neuro-Oncology for, for over 10 years uh, from 2007 to 2017. So really, really looking forward to your talk, Linda. And, and we apologize up front for having you wake up so early. Uh, just so you all know, Linda is on West Coast time, so she woke up before five to join us this morning. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, uh, it is early, so but I do have my cup of coffee here, so uh, <laughs> so uh, ready to to get started. And uh, you know, thank you for for inviting me uh, for this uh, lecture. It's it, it's really you know such an honor. Um, you know, to, to be here, um, at least virtually. Um, so today I'm going to talk about- Linda, sorry, before you start, um, Dr. Bederson asked me to give a few comments and I'm oh. really excited uh, to do so. You were not part of the uh, earlier hour because for you it was three o'clock in the morning, but um, this year research day uh, that I started 25 years ago represents also our 75th uh, anniversary of the uh, residency program. Uh, so we are really honored and delighted to have you uh, with us to share this event. 
as you can imagine, things change since we started 25 years ago with this event. Uh, the department, as you see, has a lot of young talent in all different subspecialties. And one thing that is also great to see is that instead of being just one person doing all the work, we have a dedicated team. And so I need to really acknowledge the five women that made this uh, day possible. Um, Ashley, Alyssa, Jillian, Nicole, and Sukaina. Uh, these are uh, five people that really made this event uh, for you and for all of us so successful. So thank you so much. And then um, if you allow me, just uh, in my role as the chair elect of the AANS CNS um, section on tumor, I need to say that I've been uh, working with you for all these years. Uh, you've been a leader, as we've heard, with many, many accomplishments. But to me, the one that uh, seems the most important one is that you always led us to um, reach above and beyond what we can dream and think to take care of our patients with brain tumors. And that is in your clinical work and in your research work. So thank you so much for the honor of joining us today. Well, and and thank you, Isabel. As you know, uh, you know you're you're a wonderful uh, role model for for all of us, and uh, and you know doing such a great job leading the tumor section this year. Um, so uh, my my talk today is going to be on immunotherapy for glioblastoma overcoming resistance, um, and you know it's it's going to be a combination of both. Uh, resistance on the clinical level, uh, as well as on the research level. And, and really, I think the, the struggles that, um, you know, a lot of us, and, and I know, you know, Costas and Isabel have, have been doing research in this area as well, you know, in terms of um, the struggles of getting, uh, translating discoveries in the lab, you know, uh, in, in preclinical studies into patients and, and getting, uh, getting, uh, essentially, you know, FDA approval for, for treatments for glioblastoma. So, um, so here are my disclosures. Um, and as was mentioned, uh, we, we have a, a SPORE grant. Uh, it's a P50 uh, NCI uh, grant um, uh, that's dedicated to the study of, of brain cancer. Um, we, we have this grant at UCLA and essentially it, it, it um, focuses on three different projects, but the theme of the grant is, is targeting resistance. You know, we're, we're really uh, looking at uh, kind of why uh, glioblastomas are resistant to treatments. I mean, we have treatments out there, but, but for some reason, these tumors, uh, as you all may, may know, uh, pretty much uh, universally come back. And, uh, and the three projects um, within our SPORE uh, relate to resistance to immunotherapy. That's one of the projects. Resistance to targeted inhibitors. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, there have been many, many clinical trials targeting uh, EGFR um, and the EGFR receptor, um, but unfortunately those trials have failed. And then radiation, you know, why, why does radiation um, uh, fail in, in glioblastomas. And, and just briefly, you know, I'll talk more about, you know, immunotherapy resistance and some of the mechanisms and, and, uh, and challenges that, uh, you know, that are uh, involved with uh, our understanding of, uh, you know, why uh, certain patients respond to immunotherapy and certain patients do not. Um, in terms of, e you know, EGFR and targeted inhibitor uh, resistance, you know, one thing that uh, David Nathanson in our group has found is that uh, what EGFR uh, inhibitors do is actually uh, put cells into a, a metabol an altered metabolic state. So even though the cells don't die, they are altered. And, uh, and this, this project really aims at exploiting this altered metabolic state um, by targeting, uh, you know, the, the, these uh, kind of treated cells in combination with, for instance, a, a P53 activator that induces apoptosis. So really kind of, it's a combination approach that drives uh, cells that are metabolically vulnerable to eventually die. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, I think some of the problems that, that, um, that we're having with, uh, these targeted inhibitors, even though you get, uh, site, site, um, stasis, you actually don't get cell death. And as far as radiation, um, 
you know, glioblastoma cells actually are uh, pretty sensitive to radiation therapy. If you, you know, radiate these cells in a Petri dish, they do die. Um, but unfortunately, despite radiation, these tumors do come back uh, in patients. And uh, Frank Pajunk in our, in our group actually uh, looked at this. And, and what he did was he actually... Uh, looked at uh, this, this um, concept called phenotype conversion. And it, it's really a concept where, uh, you know, tumor cells, which are sensitive to radiation, for some reason, following radiation, convert to these um, kind of stem-like cells that then become resistant to radiation. So what he did was he looked, he took these resistant cells and screened them against a panel of, you know, 2000 different uh, uh, drugs and actually found that dopamine receptor antagonists actually block this, this process of, of the tumors of the radiation sensitive cells going, going to uh, these radiation resistant tumor stem cells. So, uh, so we have a project in a clinical trial that com combines radiation with dopamine receptor antagonists. So, uh, so essentially those are the three kind of projects within our sport that, uh, you know, that really uh, try to get at the, the essential problem of uh, resistance to treatment in glioblastoma. Um, so, you know, the, the one very frustrating thing about this disease is that, uh, you know, despite many, many, um, you know, preclinical studies and clinical trials over the years, we have very few FDA approved treatments for, for glioblastoma. Um, currently, we're still treating patients with radiation, and that's been around since the 1970s. And then in the late 90s, uh, the, the gliadel wafer, the BCNU wafer was, uh, was FDA approved, and then so, and then came temozolomide. Um, but essentially, even today, standard of care is radiation and temozolomide. We really don't have um, a lot of other FDA-approved options for, for this disease. Uh, there uh, subsequently uh, has been some approvals for bevacizumab as well as tumor-treating fields. But still, you know, standard of care is still the radiation and temozolomide. Um, so... Why is that, and how do we move immunotherapy uh, in, into uh, kind of a, th this realm? Um, and uh, you know, I've, I've been studying immune therapy for for a, a long time now, and um, the uh, and you know, back in. in 2001, I can't believe this has been 20 years already. Uh, we we ed edited this, this book. Um, on brain tumor and immunotherapy. And the, the common themes back then were immunomodulation. Uh, and, you know, this is still what we're doing today, but the players are just different. You know, back then we were looking at IL-2 and if you're in ga gamma and some um, bacteria, you know, nowadays we're, we're looking at checkpoint inhibitors and, uh, and other, you know, uh, immune modulators um, of, uh, of immune cells, uh, you know, Back then, we were looking at antibodies and immunotoxins, and you know many of you may have uh, recalled the uh, pseudomonas toxin trials as well as the diphtheria toxin trials, um, and radio labeled antibodies. Uh, now we're still doing antibody uh, uh, trials, but with different players. Um, adoptive cellular immunotherapy. Back then, we were looking at lac cells, uh, cytotoxic T cells, and also some NK cell types of cellular therapies. Now people are uh, looking at CAR T cells and engineered um, uh, T cells for, for uh, brain tumors. Oncolytic viral therapy. A, uh, HSV viral therapy uh, was was uh, one of the trials going on back then, but now we're we're um, you know looking at um, you know uh, measles virus as well as polio virus and uh, and other types of oncolytic viral therapy and, and different uh, derivations thereof, and then you know tumor vaccines. Uh, Back then, we were looking at whole tumor cell, irradiated whole tumor cell vaccines. Now, um, there, there have been several clinical trials of tumor vaccines over the years. Um, and uh, the, the type of vaccines that, that we've been specifically looking at are uh, dendritic cell-based vaccines. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, but with that, uh, you know, 20 years later, we still do not have an FDA-approved immunotherapy drug for glioblastoma. And uh, 
But over the last, you know, five, five years or so, there have been more than 25 uh, cancer immunotherapy drugs for other cancers. And pretty much, you know, all these other cancers do have um, drugs that are approved for uh, or immunotherapy uh, based drugs that are approved for these cancers. So, so the question, you know, this begs the question, why, why are we not able to get um, our, you know, glioblastoma treatments, uh, you know, through the, to the finish line to FDA approval. And, um, and it's not for lack of trying. Um, there, there have been lots of uh, recent phase three um, clinical trials or large phase two trials uh, using in immunotherapeutic agents. And, uh, and, you know, this was a, a series of, uh, of trials using PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, this specific one was nivolumab. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they have clever names, Checkmate uh, 143, 498, 554, which are, you know, which were um, nivolumab in combination with radiation or, you know, nivolumab and ipilimumab. Um, and unfortunately, even though these trials and, and these agents were effective for other cancers, uh, they, they really um, did not uh, actually uh, have uh, positive results in terms of uh, the, the uh, clinical trials for glioblastoma. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, over the years, you know, that we've had uh, large clinical trials of uh, of uh, vaccines. This was uh, the EGFR, the three vaccine, and uh, and then Aegean has had the uh, heat shock protein vaccine. And uh, it's uh, it's always interesting to, to you know read the headlines. I think uh, uh, people like to write amazing headlines whenever these these trials trials fail. But unfortunately, it, this isn't really good for our patients. Um, we really need to get these treatments um, that uh, may have promise to our patients. So why is that? I mean, as, as uh, many of you may know, one problem is that glioblastoma by definition is multiforme, it's heterogeneous. Um, and the, the tumor heterogeneity is uh, makes uh, finding, um, you know, a one treatment fits all type of, of uh, scenario very different um, and difficult for these patients. And, um, and uh, you know, this is just a panel of a um, of, uh, hundred different uh, uh, tumor patient derived uh, tumor xenografts that, that we've, uh, you know, developed um, in recent years and we've done sequencing on these tumors. And as you can see, the uh, heterogeneity of, of these tumors is, is quite diverse. So, uh, so you can imagine finding a single targeted agent you know, for such a diverse population of, of tumors uh, is, is difficult. So another problem is that we don't have good animal models. Um, you know, animal studies really do not necessarily translate to efficacy in human, in human uh, glioblastoma trials. And uh, this is just an example of uh, an, an animal study that, um, that uh, you know, we did several years ago with Nori Kasuhara when he, he was at UCLA, um, looking at the, uh, you know, retroviral replicating vector uh, which uh, subsequently uh, became, you know, TOCA 511. Um, and, you know, as you can see, it, the, the, the results look really good, you know, for, uh, for the, this treatment. Um, there, you know, was uh, pre pretty much eradication of these tumors in these mouse models. And, uh, and you know, what's frustrating is that, you know, even with um, the ability to cure these tumors in mice, uh, unfortunately, these animal studies do not necessarily translate to human trials. And th the problem is that a lot of these um, immunocompetent mouse models are mouse tumors. Um, and as I mentioned, the heterogeneity of the human tumors are very difficult to model in an immunocompetent mouse. Um, and then this is what subsequently happened, you know, even though there were encouraging phase, uh, phase one and phase two studies, when these, uh, this, this trial went to phase three, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, results were, um, were not negative, were, were, were not positive, and, you know, this was not able to get FDA approval. Um, you know, so uh, there's heterogeneity, there's the, um, 
difficulty with the mouse models. And then certainly there's also, even when you get past the, uh, you know, with the, the mouse models and you get positive results, there's also selection bias of early phase clinical trials. And this was, you know, the, these were the results of the um, early phase uh, EGFR V3 peptide vaccine trials. And as you can see, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the results were, you know, quite promising, you know, there was a, you know, a, a, an extension in medial median survival. Um, however, when uh, these treatments went into, uh, um, you know, uh, phase three and later trials, uh, you know, unfortunately, that that median survival difference was not, uh, you know, uh, born out. Um, however, um, it could be that we're looking at the wrong endpoints. Um, so if you have a treatment that works in, let's say, 20, 25% of patients, and which this, you know, it's oftentimes in immunotherapy, we see this kind of long, long arm um, of the Kaplan, uh, you know, long um, duration uh, arm of the Kaplan-Meier curve, we may not be capturing this if your endpoint is a difference in median survival, because in order to achieve that, you know, more than 50% of patients would need to have a survival benefit. Another challenge is the challenge with endpoint determination. You know, unlike melanoma and other cancers, uh, with, brain, with brain cancer, it's, it's relatively difficult to go in and keep biopsying these, uh, these tumors to see what's going on. And so with a lot of our trials, we design them based on uh, progression-free survival, uh, based on imaging endpoints, basically seeing you know, what we see on, on imaging studies. And uh, unfortunately, with, uh, with immunotherapy in particular, there often is increased contrast enhancement because there's an infl inflammatory response to the treatment. And this is very difficult to differentiate from tumor progression. And, you know, over the years, there have been different um, criteria for how to, you know, measure uh, response or, or, you know, progression-free survival in these patients. And, you know, we, we, a lot of trials started with the McDonald criteria, and then we've gone to RENO and then IRENO, which, which is the immune, ther you know, immune-based um, uh, you know, re response assessment in neuro oncology, but even you know, even with all these different modifications, it's still very difficult to definitively um, tell what's tumor and what's not in these um, in these uh, clinical trials. Um, and this is just an example of, of you know, a classic pseudo progression response in, in immunotherapy. Um, this is a patient, you know, post radiation, and then the patient got a, a, a dendritic cell vaccine, and you can see it looks like there's tumor progression. And this tumor progression or, or this, this increase in contrast enhancement can, can persist for up to six months uh, before it actually kind of subsides. And this particular patient, uh, luckily, he didn't have symptoms symptoms through this. So we just waited it out. Um, and then eventually it did, did subside. But oftentimes, it, it, it's hard to know during this period, you know, is, is this tumor progression or is this not? And then, you know, you have to, oftentimes patients are taken off trials, uh, because, uh, you know, it's hard to differ, uh, differentiate the two. So the current challenges of glioblastoma uh, cl clinical immunotherapy trials, um, I think highlight um, some of the problems we're having in the field in terms of moving these treatments to, uh, you know, to FDA approval and, and to eventually to get these uh, treatments to patients. And, you know, there, there are challenges with randomized clinical trials. Um, for instance, you know, patient recruitment and retention is getting more and more difficult because it's really difficult to keep patients on placebo controlled you know, the, the placebo arm of these trials, um, because, you know, quite frankly, if I were a patient, I did, wouldn't necessarily want to be, uh, you know, uh, on, on, a, on the placebo arm of, of a, a glioblastoma trial when um, they, they're really, um, you know, are, are potentially other, you know, a phase, you know, earlier phase options. So, so, you know, I think we really do need to think about how we conduct these trials. Um, and, and whether having a control arm 
is is you know necessary or, or even ethical um, you know moving forward. Um, and and part of this you know problem is also because glioblastoma is is essentially rare. Um, it, it's you know it's 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 much less common than the bigger cancers you know breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. But even within glioblastoma, what we're learning is that there's so many different subgroups you know because of the tumor heterogeneity. So if you kind of parse that all out and you're finding treatments that are, are, are effective for specific subgroups, then you really have a very small population of, of patients that certain treatments could work on. And to design a clinical trial to, to show efficacy in those small numbers is, is very, uh, very difficult to do in, you know, to, to get that statistical power. So, so I think that's, you know, one, one problem we're having. And then, as I mentioned, the lack of imaging correlates and biomarkers of response. And then even, you know, oftentimes during a clinical trial, um, which could take years to complete, the, the field has changed, you know, the, the you know, new, new biomarkers or, or new, um, uh, new prognostic markers are, are discovered along the way, which kind of changes your initial assumptions about what, you know, what is a uh, positive versus a negative response. So, um, so one concept that has been uh, gaining some traction recently is the use of um, external control arms. And this has become uh, uh, more common in, in uh, trials for other cancers and, and also for rare diseases. Uh, and, and the concept is that um, rather than having large, you know, several hundred trial uh phase three randomized controlled trials of several hundred patients. Um, the concept is to uh, use external data uh, with, you know, propensity weighting or dynamic borrowing and, and uh, doing a more of an adaptive trial where we could use uh, external data as the control arm uh, and then compare that to large single uh, arm uh, novel, you know, treatment studies. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of, and there's different, you know, sources of data that, that these, you know, that can be used for this. The most, um, you know, kind of, I guess, favorable data for this are uh, from large, well-controlled, randomized controlled trials. Um, and because the data is collected very uniformly and, and you know, there, there's a rich database uh, for, for these types of trials. So, you know, so what, one question was, you know, whether or not there are such databases for glioblastomas, you know, do we have uh, that, that control data? And, you know, if we look at our, you know, glioblastoma trials over the last decade, we actually do, you know, so, you know, if we pull, for instance, the, the you know, large uh, randomized phase three trials that have been done over the last, you know, 10, you know, seven years or so, and these are kind of five of the big uh, randomized trials, and unfortunately, they all failed in terms of um, uh, survival benefit, um, other than the uh, the uh, optune the, the tumor treating field trial. But uh, but th these are this is the data for the control arm, and you can see, and there you know over you know I guess with these trials there were you know a total of over thirteen hundred control patients, and the median survival really is pretty tight. You know we're we're talking about fifteen to seventeen months in the control arm, and these are the Kaplan Meier cur curves um, for the control arm for these trials, and you can see they're they're quite um, consistent and overlapping. So th the question is, you know, it begs the question: Why would we need to? Um, put another, you know, thousands and thousands of patients on the control arm for these trials, if we could somehow use the data we have already uh, to, you know, test our novel treatments. Um, and, um, and so that's, you know, um, a concept that I think is, is, you know, gaining some, some traction, and, and hopefully, you know, we will be able to think of you know, more innovative ways to design our trials. And there already are, you know, groups um, such as uh, GBM Agile and, and others that are looking at different uh, kind of designs for adaptive trials for glioblastoma. Um, and so, so when, when, you know, 
one thing to consider is, well, could this, you know, if we, you, you compare a treatment to a uh, kind of historical control or external control arm, could it erroneously, uh, I guess, find a positive signal in a, uh, in a treatment that didn't work? And uh, so, so looking at this, so if you, you know, if what, what we did was we looked at the, uh, for instance, the Celdex trial, uh, the Rindapipimat trial, and plotted that, you know, the treatment arm against these control arms. And as you can see, this is the blue line here. The treatment arm actually is pretty uh, consistent with the control arm showing that there was no survival benefit with that treatment, as well as, you know, dose dense temozolomide, which, you know, was reassuring that, um, that you, you know, probably would not get a false positive if, uh, you know, use, if you use these large um, numbers of uh, external controls. Um, looking at recurrent glioblastoma trials, you see a similar kind of very kind of tight median survival uh, uh, data, um, although, uh, you know, a little bit more variability in terms of uh, re the recurrent uh, glioblastoma um, uh, treatment arms for these trials. So, so that, you know, so I, I guess I just wanted to bring up that this is a new way to think about trials as we move our treatments, you know, to a larger phase, you know, phase two and phase three trials. But ultimately, the goal of these trials is really to get, you know, get potentially effective treatments to patients. And I think one thing that's very frustrating about immunotherapy is that we still know, um, you know, we're learning more about the field, but we still know relatively little about these interactions between the tumor cell and the immune cell. Um, at, um, and, uh, and also, uh, the, the environment within the brain. And nowadays we're also, you know, finding that it's not just interactions between the tumor cell and the immune cells, but also the neurons and the glia within the, the, uh, the, the brain also talk to tumor cells. So, so it's a very uh, complex interaction. And if you think about designing a multi-year trial with that, with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of patients, you have to make certain assumptions going into the trial, which may or may not be true by the time you finish the trial, because the field is changing so rapidly. And, um, and you know, one, one thing that uh, we, we've uh, learned, you know, over the years is that uh, with immunotherapy, perhaps timing, or, or maybe not timing, but the sequence of treatment matters, uh, as well as, you know, the, uh, the extent of resection, or, you know, how much residual res disease is left over. And also, as I mentioned, the tumor microenvironment. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, all the uh, PD-1 inhibitor trials, the, you know, checkpoint inhibitor trials that have gone to phase three, um, uh, studies have have not been successful, um, but uh, you know uh, Tim Clausey and um, and Patrick Wen and, and you know uh, uh, you know people in, in our group and many other centers did this uh, small uh, randomized trial to look at uh, the neoadjuvant use of PD one inhibitors. So basically, giving the drug before surgery. And uh, granted, this was a very small trial. Uh, it did show it was randomized, and it did show that the neoadjuvant arm, meaning um, if you gave the, the PD one inhibitor before surgery, you actually got an increased uh, you know median survival, and uh, and we also you know uh, found that there was uh, a change in terms of the uh, gene expression profile um, of of the neoadjuvantly treated tumors, suggesting uh, you know an upregulation of uh, interferon gamma signals and uh, T cell infiltration. So, so that showed some promise that maybe if we use these drugs neoadjuvantly, it may um, uh, show a benefit. Um, however, in other studies, um, and this was a, a study published by uh, Samir Khalif's uh, group, um, what uh, people have shown was that at least in animal models, uh, PD-1 blockade may actually cause a subpriming of the, the uh, CD8 cells or the, the uh, effector T cells. So, so you actually may um, uh, 
you know, make these cells, even though it, it primes these cells, they're so primed and they're really, they then subsequently become dysfunctional and uh, resistant to subsequent therapy. So, um, so I think there, there is a complex interplay in terms of, you know, how to use these checkpoint inhibitors and, uh, and actually when to use it. So one thought about why, um, you know, in this prior study, why neoadjuvant uh, PD-1 inhibitors may show a benefit, whereas if you used it, you know, after the tumor got, came out, it may not, is that you actually need the tumor there as the antigen source, because you need the, the antigen in order to activate the T cells uh, to come into the tumor. So, uh, so the, the question is, well, is it the necessity for the T cells to come in, or is it something else that's going on, um, you know, in, in, uh, in this immune microenvironment? So we recently started a new clinical trial um, uh, that's, that was sponsored by our, our SPORT grant at UCLA, where we, 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 looked to, we looked to answer this question, you know, whether um, it would be uh, of benefit to use a neoadjuvant uh, PD-1 inhibitors uh, or, or, or not, uh, you know, in, in combination with, a, a, you know, a vaccine. And in this case, we used a dendritic cell vaccine. So patients were randomized to either neoadjuvant uh, anti-PD-1 or placebo, and then they received surgery, and then they subsequently got the uh, PD-1 uh, inhibitor or, um, or placebo. And, um, and, you know, interestingly, what we found was actually not what we had expected to find uh, in, in the, uh, you know, uh, the, the first, uh, you know, cohort of patients we treated. And this is one example of, uh, of, of a patient and, and you know, uh, and we've seen a couple others of these now in terms of what happens. So the so this is a patient who actually randomized to the uh, anti PD one uh, antibody neoadjuvantly. So the patient got you know got the drug before surgery. We did surgery, made a vaccine for him, and then subsequently gave him the anti um, the autologous tumor lysate uh, dendritic cell vaccine plus uh, plus the PD one inhibitor, um, and. Uh, following the vaccine, you know, we looked at a CRP and actually IL-6 levels and, and those levels, you know, each time he had the vaccine, the level went up very high. Uh, the first time it went up so high that he actually had this huge inflammatory response and that I had to take him back to surgery uh, to, to take out, uh, you know, this, you know, the, the tumor in uh, the, the contrast enhancing mass and pathologically it actually came back as inflammation. It actually was not too recurrence, but it was just so uh, such an intense inflammatory response that, that we had to take him back to surgery. Um, but that gave us some very good data in terms of what, what we actually see in the tumor following these treatments. But, uh, but each time, you know, after surgery, it actually, you know, the mass effect went down and then we vaccinated him again. Uh, and then uh, again, the, you know, the, the, the inflammatory response uh, was, uh, you know, came up. And, and in this case, we gave him a P, uh, IL-6 inhibitor, uh, tocilizumab, who, which brought it down. And then actually, uh, Avastin, uh, Bev, um, Bevacizumab actually was able to, you know, control some of this, uh, you know, immune mediated inflammation. Um, so what happens, you know, in the brain uh, when, with, with these vaccines and immune therapies? And so this is a, what happened, you know, so this is a sample of that patient's tumor. Uh, after just the PD-1 antibody. And you could see that uh, there, there was some, uh, you know, some T cells, uh, the CD3, that the red staining is the T cells, the T cells that do get into the tumor. And, you know, initially that's kind of what we thought happened with the, the neoadjuvant PD-1 inhibitors. It's basically a way to drive T cells into the tumor. And then after, uh, you know, after the second surgery, when he got the vaccine, again, you know, we saw, you know, a little bit more T cells. So, so, you know, good thing, we're getting more T cells into the tumor. But what we also saw was that uh, it, it drives uh, macrophages. So, th so this is a, a stain for the macrophages in green. It drives macrophages into the tumor. And then this is, and then following the vaccine, we actually get a very high macrophage response uh, to, to, uh, to the vaccine. 
um, plus the PE1 inhibitor. So one thought is that perhaps the efficacy that we're seeing in the neoadjuvant uh, use of PD1 inhibitors is not necessarily just you know, higher infiltration of T cells, but perhaps a polarization of the macrophages to, to a more um, uh, you know, uh, immune supportive uh, environment uh, for, for an anti-tumor immune response. Um, but then when we look at what happens in combination when we do neoadjuvant uh, PD-1 blockade and vaccination. Uh, so th there seems to be this uh, huge inflammatory response. Uh, so this is before this is after neoadjuvant PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, we see T cells, um, the the red cells here, uh, and uh, and macrophages, the green cells, you know, in this bed of tumor cells. Um, following uh, dendritic cell vaccination and PD-1 inhibition, we see this this you know huge infiltration of 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 both things. You know, T cells come in, but then also the green cells, the, the macrophages come in. So, it's, and then there's the blue cells, the tumor cells. So essentially, you have this huge battle <laughs> that's going on in the brain with all these different cell populations. And we're now in the process of doing you know single cell sequencing and, and all of this to really kind of define what what is going on here. But I think. What this tells us is that we really need to think about what order we, we give these immunotherapeutic uh, treatments in. And I think um, what we need to do is actually uh, prime the T cells before we give checkpoint blockade because we need the T cells to get in uh, and with, you know, to, in order to get uh, a durability of, of response uh, for these uh, kind of more um, novel immune therapies. And then there's the concept of immune exhaustion where it, T cells may get in, but then after a period of time, they get exhausted. So uh, there, you know, there's also the combination of drugs that, um, that can block T cell exhaustion that, that's being considered as well. So in conclusion, um, how to, you know, I guess with all of this, you know, we, we're still at a point where uh, we, as I mentioned, we still don't have you know, good immunotherapeutic treatments, you know, that, that are available for our patients. And I think, you know, what we need are uh, better immunocompetent animal models that better recapitulate the tumor and the host heterogeneity. Um, but ultimately we need to do uh, better clinical trials, better early phase trials and, and, uh, and more adaptive trials, because I, I don't think any animal model could totally, you know, model the human response uh, to, to these drugs. And uh, so I think we, we need to develop, uh, you know, better biomarkers either in the, you know, tumor samples, blood or, or CSF, and also imaging, uh, you know, um, biomarkers. And, uh, you know, our group's been working quite a bit in, in terms, um, quite a bit with uh, imaging uh, in terms of MRI and PET biomarkers for immune cells uh, to really kind of better visualize, you know, kind of what's going on uh, in, in that uh, tumor microenvironment. And then, as, as I mentioned, you know, the use of adaptive control designs uh, for uh, FDA registration trials, if, if that, that could uh, help, you know, push these, uh, th these treatments along, I think that would be beneficial for our patients. And, uh, and because there is such a complex interplay of, as I mentioned, all these different cell populations now within the brain tumor, I think it's going to be very difficult um, to do uh, kind of single agent trials and, 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 you know, show efficacy. I think we need to really do combination trials. And it's not just, you know, combinations of different drugs, but it's combinations of different drugs at different times uh, in combination, you know, with surgery um, to really look at what's going on in these patients. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, you know, this was just, uh, you know, a summary of, of uh, of work done by a large, large group of people at UCLA. We have 20 different labs that study brain cancer. And, uh, and I think, you know, my, my colleagues there have just been, been, you know, wonderful to work with. And, uh, and, you know, I thank all of you here for, for your time. And, uh, you, you know, 
I really have uh, enjoyed working with you, Costas and Isabel, in, in the tumor you know, area. I know you, you both have been thinking about this quite a bit as well. And I hope we do someday get to you know, some really meaningful treatments for our patients. So thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. That was really an amazing uh, talk that really covers the, all the challenges we're seeing in immunotherapy and brain tumors in general. We do have some time for some questions, so I'd love to open that up to our group. I have a bunch, but I want everyone else to go first. So, uh, Linda, this was a yeah. tour de force. This was amazing, and uh, thank you for not only putting it all together, but presented to us with the great enthusiasm that we know is part of you. Uh, the concept of um, immune exhaustion is uh, emerging. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and whether or not we could use it as a possible targeting strategy as well? Yeah, very good question. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't quite decided how I feel about this because, you know, I've talked a lot with um, Tony Rebus, who's, who's at UCLA, and he, he does a lot of work in melanoma. And, you know, melanoma, unlike glioblastoma, you know, fortunately, gets they, they have a lot of T cells in, in those tumors. And that's why they're they're immunogenic. And the, the thought is that, well, does, does that matter? You know, so if you if you drive enough T cells, even if a subpopulation of them become exhausted, if you have you know enough of them that aren't exhausted, um, you know, does it matter that some of them become exhausted? So is it is it really the you know the numbers or is it the exhaustion? And I, I you know I, I I guess it'd be great if you know you get large numbers of unexhausted T cells, but but it could be that maybe it doesn't necessarily matter. Because T cell, you know, there will be a population that becomes exhausted. But as long as you could keep driving, kind of the you know new populations of T cells that will attack the tumor, um, the you know looking at exhaustion, you know may may not you know be be necessarily as uh, you know as important. So so I guess you know one thought is it it's like is it necessary to to revive those old exhausted T cells, or should we just drive new young T cells <laughs> into the tumor, uh, you know, to, to do the same thing? Um, I, I, I think I'm more in favor of the latter, but, uh, but I think, you know, the, the, we still need to do the trials to know. D Dr. Liao, Dolores Hambarzumian is one of our world famous macrophage experts <laughs> at brain tumors. She has a question for you. Hi, Linda, that was a beautiful talk and thank you so much for joining us and so early for you. So I really enjoyed your talk. So I have a couple of questions. In the trial that you had neoadjuvant anti-PD-1 in combination with DC vaccine that you saw massive infiltration of macrophages, have you, I mean, do you have any preclinical data in mouse models that uh, you can target macrophage infiltration? What kind of effect you would get there if you combine there, for example, with CSF1 receptor inhibitor? Yeah, great question. That is actually our next four project. Um, so yeah, so we actually have, uh, you know, our, you know, uh, have a collaboration with BMS. So on, uh, on a CSS, for, you know, one inhibitor, exactly. And we do have uh, some animal studies uh, that that show actually, uh, you know, a great response with that in, you know, in, in animal models. And, uh, and I think that's part of it, I think, as, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we actually saw this in animal models, but the, the human study, you know, or I showed you was actually the first time we've actually seen it in a human because it was uh -huh. rare that we actually got the sample at that time point. But, uh, but with that, I, I, I think, yeah, the, the next step is to combine, um, you know, the, the, uh, the vaccine with the checkpoint inhibitor and then a CSF1 inhibitor, because I think you need to, you know, prime the T cells to get in you know, block the checkpoints, right? Block the cells with the PD-1. But then unfortunately, when you do those two in combination, what happens is you drive this population of macrophages in. So we need something to block that. Yeah, and they can suppress the function of your T cells, not necessarily only through checkpoint or PD-1, pd one because they express high level, but they also secrete other molecules that can suppress your 
uh, infiltrated T cell function. So that's 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 cool. And I also have another question about the uh, checkpoint resistant mechanisms. Since you guys are expert there, so I can ask. Uh, so in a pediatric patients with glioblastoma, patients that have MMR deficiency germline, there is a response, and it's not one case, but there are already the cases like numbers are rising. I mean, it's an individual case studies combined together because those are rare. I wonder if you uh, gave a thought or uh, any idea because somatic MMR mutation in GBM patient doesn't result the response to checkpoint blockade. If you can comment on that, what do you think that would be in the case of adult GBM? If yeah. you have any data there? Yeah, so pediatric GBMs are very different, I think. I think yes. they're just a totally different disease. And I think it really depends. So pediatric GBMs, you know, they, they're, they're driven by different, I, I think, different mechanisms. So, so uh, and, you know, the, the common ones are the, you know, the K27, you know, the, the kind of the midline ones. And then there's yes. also the G34 uh, yes. mutations, which are the more lateral um, kind of uh Hemospheric, uh, hemospheric, uh, you know, uh, tumors, and uh, and and they they and and it, they, I I think they're fascinating. So we actually have um, one of our pediatric uh, neurosurgeons, Anthony Wong, is actually working on a vaccine uh, to target G thirty four, and um, and it, it's interesting. They're they're you know they're both you know mutations on on you know histone mutations, but they're mutually exclusive. You actually never see a K twenty seven mutation tumor uh, that's also G, yeah at the GBM um, uh, that's also G34 mutated and vice versa so I think with these pediatric tumors th they probably do have um, uh, kind of driver um, targets that you could actually target with the immunotherapy because because unlike you know adult glioblastomas where there's like hundreds and hundreds of mutations and it's there's no really you know, even I think EGFR was the kind of the cl closest, but mm -hmm. even that there, there's no real um, kind of driver mutation that we could target with the um, immunotherapeutic um, target. I think with the pediatric tumors, um, if there is a dominant epitope, for instance, in one of these, you know, kind of mutations, perhaps that's why, uh, you know, immunotherapy may work better in, in, in that population. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. Linda, we have an interesting question from Dr. Olka Sajdev, whose father we're honoring today uh, with mm -hmm. your lecture, actually. So she uh, is doing research on ischemia-induced injury in muscle stem cells, and she wants to know, uh, in other ca cancers, improving blood flow by deterring angiogenesis can normalize the vessels, can help improve chemotherapeutic delivery. So she's assuming that this process can occur with T-cells to tumor. So is vessel organization a consideration in these tumors? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, as you know, you know, that's kind of what we all thought uh, that, you know, bevacizumab was doing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, an improved response that perhaps, you know, maybe it was normalizing the blood vessels so that our, our you know, therapeutics were getting in better. Um, I, I think the jury's still out on on that. But I, I, I honestly do believe that it does, you know, help with, um, you know, with immunotherapy, uh, whether it's actually the, the T cells getting in or, uh, or something else, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't think, you know, we have the studies to really show that, but, uh, but I think um, as far as uh, Im improving the, the immune response, I, I think what it may do is actually keep, uh, you know, perhaps keep out the macrophages or, 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 you know, or somehow balance, you know, the T cells and the macrophages and, uh, and, you know, normalize that, you know, that a little bit more, because um, as I showed you in that patient that, that we treated, and we've, we've done a few more of these now, uh, the, the, you know, uh, bevacizumab actually works really well to, to, you know, modulate that kind of excessive immune, uh, you know, inflammation that we get. Okay, one last Hi, question Lester. by our graduating chief resident, Dr. Ernest Bartholomew. Ernest, would you like to share your question? Sure, thank you. And Dr. Leal, thank you for an extraordinary talk. Um, uh, two things. First, you mentioned when reviewing the absence of FDA uh, approval for immunotherapy for GBM that um, the three, uh, you read these three, uh, nivolumab, 
paradigms. You said it has, they haven't shown to be effective uh, for other cancers, but not GBM, and you attributed that to the heterogeneity of GBM. Um, what are some of those other cancers? Um, I suspect there's heterogeneity in, in those tumors as well, and have we able, been able to sort of inform our next steps in GBM from those examples? And my second question is regarding the pseudo-progression um, uh, on imaging. Did, uh, can we distinguish uh, pseudo-progression with uh, MR spectroscopy? Yeah, good questions. Um, so, on um, you know, in your first question, yeah, yes, for those other cancers, there have been been multiple. You know, the most uh, common is melanoma, um, but but also you know there's lung cancer and and uh, multiple other cancers for which checkpoint inhibitors are. Um, um, you know, are effective. And, and it's really changed the landscape for, for, you know, a lot of these patients with, with can systemic cancers. I think um, for brain cancer, it's, it's heterogeneity, but it, it's, you know, much more than that. I think it's also, uh, you know, the, the blood brain barrier, um, and as well as uh, kind of the, the, the the microenvironment within the brain in, in the sense that, you know, for many years, as, as you know, the, the people thought the brain was immune privileged, but um, it's not really immune privileged. It's just immune different <laughs> uh, because I think the immune T cell or the immune and tumor cell interactions different. And then there's also, as I mentioned, I, I didn't show the data here, but um, what we're finding is that it's not just the, T, the, the tumor cell and the immune cells, but there's also uh, talk from the glia, the astrocytes, as well as the neurons that, that, that are kind of, you know, enhancing tumor growth. So I think it's, it's, it's quite a complex interplay of different cell types that are not present, you know, in other parts of the body. So that, so that's one thing. And, and, and you're right, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of our studies uh, in glioblastoma have been translated from studies in other cancers. Uh, one for ex is, uh, example is, you know, in, um, you know in, in certain cancers, it's been found that uh, immune therapy works better when there is a high mutational load. Um, but actually there is just some recent publications just in the last couple months that actually showed the opposite for glio, you know, gliomas that, that some, you know, uh, for instance, the, the polio virus or other things that are thought to be, you know, uh, functioning by a immune mechanism actually work better in tumors with a low mutational load, which is a little, you know, paradoxical. So, uh, so I think we, we, we just don't know enough to answer that question. Um, and your second question about MR spectroscopy. Um, so, yeah, so MR spectroscopy is, you know, you know, as you know, it looks at the chemical composition, you know, within the, the spectra of the MRI scan. Um, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, it's good. And I guess it doesn't give enough detail to differentiate like what's an immune cell spectra versus what's a tumor cell spectra. So I think spectroscopy has some limits uh, related to that. Um, but uh, PET scan, you know, if you have a good tracer, you know, it really, you know, is, is a potential option. And one thing we're looking at are uh, different pet tracers that actually, you know, are kind of basically you, they're, they're these, you know, the agnostic approaches where you have either an antibody or, you know, a microantibody that could target a tumor cell, but it also has a, uh, you know, a, a pet, uh, you know, um, ligand that, that you could detect on imaging. Okay. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Once again, Linda, really.